Hi, everybody. I'll just give everybody a couple minutes to to join. Is Megan on? Um, I don't supposed know. to zoom the meeting, right? Yes. I just sent her. Hi guys. Hey. Anisha, you're showing up as Susan Stetzer. Really? On my, oh. on my computer. I tried to rename me and I think I didn't, I must have renamed you instead. <laughs> That's I fine. I'll rename myself. Can you rename yourself? Let's see. Yeah. I didn't think I'd be allowed to do that. Hey guys, sorry about the delay. There you go. Hey Megan, how's it going? I'm good. Had a little long. <laughs> um, okay. Is Megan, you're the co-host now. Yes. Okay. Okay, we'll we'll give like everybody like one more minute, um, and then we'll start. I know. Um, we have guests from the controller's office who have a, a hard deadline for, for right after seven. Okay. Let's go ahead. I think we have a quorum. And get started. Um, we'll approve the minutes from last month. Um, so we'll do a roll call vote to approve those. Um, Megan, if you want to do the roll call um, for any guests that we have or members from the public who are uh, joining our meeting tonight, if you could list your name and affiliation, type it into the chat box. Um, and as a reminder, the chat is really to be used for technical questions. Um, if you're having problems with Zoom um, or anything else and not really to have sort of secondary discussions about whatever is being talked about. Um, we do have one presentation tonight, um, no resolutions. This is going to be more of a brainstorming meeting um, to discuss you know, all of the different ideas that are out there um, for how we uh, recover um, and sort of have an inclusive recovery, a just recovery, any type of recovery <laughs> um, for um, economic development. Um, so this was sort of proposed last month as a space for um, board members to contribute ideas and then we'll figure out what we'd like to talk about um, and write resolutions for the future. So. Megan, take it away. Okay, um, so this is a vote to approve last month's minutes. Um, Anisha Stephen? Yes. Megan Joy? Yes. Um, Alistair Economakis? Alistair, was that a yes? He yes. said yes, it cut out a little bit. Yeah. Um, Andrea Gordillo? Yes. Herman Hewitt? Yes. Joseph Kearns. Is that you, Joseph? I think so. Uh, David Louie? Yes. Alexandra Militano? Yes. Richard Ropiak? Yes. Rodney Washington? Yes. Andrew Comey? Yes. Great. Thank you guys so much. We will hand it over to Luke um, from the controller's office who 
you all have seen at our full board meetings um, to give us a presentation about um, some small business initiatives or ideas that the controller's office has been circulating. It's uh, nice to see you all and thank you for inviting us to present. Um, I'm joined here by Adam Foreman, who's my colleague in the controller's office from our policy team and uh, uh, is the architect and mastermind behind the report, which we're going to share today. He um, is going to walk through a lot of our recommendations which we have for small businesses. We know that CB3 especially um, has uh, a number of small businesses who are struggling, who have gone out of business. And um, we really, uh, at the controller's office, want to make sure that those businesses are able to come back and uh, have a number of recommendations to hopefully drive them in the right direction. And that involves what the city can do, what the state can do, what the federal government can do, and also what community can do to kind of get involved. Um, so thank you for this. And uh, I'll turn it over to Adam. And um, like you mentioned, we do have a hard stop right around 7.15, but anything we don't get to or any other questions, um, happy to answer those uh, offline, email, or um, come back another time, whatever's best for the committee. Awesome. Adam, kick it over to you. Yeah, uh, you guys can hear me all right. Um, thank you so much for that introduction and, and for having me uh, here tonight. Um, so yeah, as Luke mentioned, um, you know, I think the controller, like every elected official, every city council member, like is deeply concerned about you know, the increase in vacancies uh, about the state of our small businesses. Uh, and we tried to come up with a pretty comprehensive plan for how we can address this. Uh, both things we can do at the city level, uh, also state legislation, you know, how we can help small businesses now, how we can help launch new businesses in order to fulfill uh, fill vacancies. I and mean, then also just how to make our neighborhoods stronger so that people can get to local businesses. You know, ultimately, if your retail corridor isn't accessible uh, for young families, for people you know, who are running errands, who are elderly, who are, have ability um, or disabled, like you're not gonna get all the customers in your area. So it's about also making opening up our streets to make sure uh, it's accessible for all New Yorkers. Um, so I actually I'll share the screen. Is that, can I share the screen? Just run through our recommendations. I believe you can. Um, Megan, Same. I need to make him a co-host or? I just did that. I just made him a co-host. Okay, yeah, let me Thank try. you. I also just dropped uh, the report in the chat in case people want to follow along or circle back to it later. And I'll just go, go through the recommendations because hopefully some of them will inspire you guys or, um, you know, kind of feel a little bit. Um, I think the first hey, one- can everyone, can everyone mute? That's not, um, that's not Andrew or, or that's Adam. not Adam. <laughs> um, so the first one is really pertinent right now. The PPP program was just relaunched uh, by Congress last, about a week and a half ago. Uh, it's help some businesses that are small, they can get a second PPP loan. Uh, it reduces the kind of aggravations uh, and obligations for those who haven't gotten one yet in terms of what you can use it for, use it for PPE, use it for reopening your business. Um, there's a huge, you know, several hundred million dollar pot that's available and the city's just not doing a good enough job, I think, reaching out to local businesses. Uh, so we really call for a kind of door-to-door -door service, work with community boards, work with bids, um, you know, really get the word out that people can apply. Um, it's a pretty, it's become a pretty streamlined process, um, but it's, you know, I think a lot of people are, don't know about it or we're wary of it because of all the restrictions in the first round. Um, so we think, you know, it's really important to do and the city's luckily is doing out of SBS some um, events right now to help people go through the process, but we could be doing a lot more and really teaming up with bids and community boards and um, chambers of commerce throughout the city. Uh, another thing we talk about, uh, and again, this is like three main buckets. One is how we help businesses right now, how we reopen businesses, and then how we invest in neighborhoods. Uh, you know, so for helping businesses right now, the tax credits is crucial. Um, in addition to the PPP programs, you know, we're calling for city and state tax credits uh, for reopening costs. Uh, you know, all the PPE equipment you uh, have to purchase, all the outdoor seating, et cetera. Uh, we're calling for a tech core, uh, CUNY. We've been talking in talks with CUNY and we really want this to advance uh, that, you know, CUNY students could be helping out uh, business owners, helping launch websites, um, helping, uh, especially retailers, less so restaurants, um, get their goods out uh, in a time when there is, you know, real social distance requirements that restrict um, selling. Um, and then I think a really big one and one that we all um, feel and understand is just, we need to kind of improve rules, regulations uh, in the city, both helping out uh, reopening businesses, 
uh, and then also fines and fees. Uh, there needs to be like a one-stop shop for businesses to go to uh, in order to uh, get approvals, in order to uh, deal with fines and fees, and we need to be moving towards a cure period. This is not a time uh, to have you know, fines and fees. People should have an opportunity um, to sort of rem remedy the situation uh, and not just get uh, a pile of, of new violations. Uh, we also talk a bunch about you know state regulations you know for liquor laws um, to make it easier for people to take uh, to go uh, and also we've, we've seen the capping of the um, delivery party fees we want that to keep on going uh, into the future uh, and next for supporting uh, you know businesses to, to open you know the fact of the matter is we have see already seen lots of vacancies um, and we need to make sure that you know as the vaccine we have widespread uh, implementation of the vaccine and you know, new businesses open uh, really quickly. And one way we think we can do that is uh, just canceling all fees uh, for registering a new business and for getting inspections. There should be like a six month period where there could be a rush. Um, you know, if you site, open up a new business now, it's gonna be a streamlined process. It's gonna be a cheaper process. You're not gonna have to pay for the department of buildings and FDNY uh, inspections uh, or, you know, for all the permits you need, all those fees, fines and fees are um, suspended so that there is kind of an enthusiasm and, and a rush to open up a business. And also a temporary like six month to one year uh, cancellation of all those fines and fees. Uh, we also just, as we said before, just pushing, putting pressure on the city. So they've done this a little bit with restaurants, but uh, more so across the board. Uh, you know, it should be a one-stop shop for opening up a business. You shouldn't have to bounce around to 18 different agencies uh, in order to do this. Uh, and particularly we talk about, speaking about tax incentives, uh, number 12 here is, um, or excuse me, uh, yeah, number 12 is, you know, tax incentives specifically for high vacancy retail corridors um, that we should be, uh, that's a way to kind of encourage businesses is uh, property taxes should be forgiven uh, in those areas for a set period. Now, so there's some of the key ones there and you guys can, we can go over other ones that are on that list. Uh, and then finally, in terms of investing in neighborhoods, um, this is where we talk a lot about, some things have already been implemented. You know, we were really pushed for uh, outdoor retail uh, it's been implemented, which is fantastic. That needs to be uh, permanent. Uh, open restaurants, open retail, closing streets, uh, expanding sidewalks. You know that we, I think we've seen during this period that our sidewalks are much too narrow for socially distancing and the garbage piling up and street seating and ten other things. Um, you know we need to, I think, widen sidewalks uh, so that we have more space for for retailers, for restaurants. You know that needs to be going forward. A, a really important way to uh, restart. Um, our, our city, our retail corridors. Uh, and we also, um, we talk a lot about bike lanes and, and bus lanes and expanding opportunities to get to our retail corridors, especially for workers. Uh, people who work in, in these commercial corridors uh, really rely on buses, really rely on bikes, really rely on walking um, to get to their jobs, more so than people who work downtown who are taking the subway from all over the place and commuter rail from all over the place. Uh, those who work especially outside of, of Manhattan really need bus lanes and bike lanes and you know, wider sidewalks to get to work, but also in Manhattan as well. Um, and so we're really talking about expanding this infrastructure so that people can get to people can get to their jobs, but also customers um, can very easily get to uh, businesses, you know, bike parking, expanding sidewalks, more street seating, et cetera, more inviting retail environments. Um, so we think that's key. Um, so yeah, those are that's kind of the three main hubs here. Sorry to, to race through it a bit, um, but but yeah, I kind of curious to hear kind of your feedback on on these ideas uh, and other ones that I didn't touch on. Uh, but I think it's a very fairly comprehensive plan that hopefully Luke has shared with you. Yeah, please, Richard. Um, I'm curious about the. Eliminating the expediters at the Department of Buildings. Yeah, I mean, I think this is, uh, you know, kind of a stain on the city in some ways. You know, our, our, our bureaucrat, we have such a bureaucratic maze that so many restaurants, um, so many new businesses need to actually hire expediters to get through the 18 different uh, boxes you need to check, the 10 different agencies you need to approve. Um, so it's less about like banning expediters and more about making. Um, you know, our, our city bureaucracy a lot easier so that we don't need um, that, that outside help. We don't have that extra layer uh, of, 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 of costs uh, in order to open up a business. Uh, you know, we've seen some minimal progress with like the, the DOB now having an online, um, uh, an online sign up for, for permits, et cetera, but there, there needs to be doing so much more. We need a one-stop shop, 
whether it's, you know, what we were calling for is something they did with, with restaurants uh, in the late Bloomberg years and kind of gave up, which was, it was a one-stop hub for opening up uh, a restaurant because it's a, a challenge to do so. When you're converting a retail uh, space to a restaurant space, you have to add uh, areas for, you know, for, for stoves uh, and for ventilation, et cetera. Like that's very complicated and it takes a lot of different agencies. Um, we need to do that, not just for restaurants, though, all different uh, businesses. If they're opening up, they shouldn't have to go to nine different agencies. There should be a point person within city government who handles that for you. Okay, thank you for that. But I think that the you touched on it a little bit. I think the idea might be less to eliminate the expediters and to reform the Department of Buildings and good luck with that. Mm -hmm. But the second question that I had uh, was for item number 14. Mm -hmm. Harness the city procurement for MWBEs. I know there's been progress, slow, painful progress over the years, but it's been in existence for 30 years. Mm -hmm. So what is it that is actually going to be proposed that would improve that system? Because like I said, it's been around for a hell of a long time and has not accomplished as much as it was intended to do. Yeah. I mean, yeah, as you said, it's been very, it's been steady improvement, but very slow and not where we need it to be. Uh, I think, you know, our office in particular has, um, you know, tried to improve oversight and improve results. Uh, you know, we have a chief diversity officer. We grade every single agency on how well they're doing on uh, procurement. And we've seen throughout our seven years that every agency has improved uh, because their feet are being held to the fire because there's that, you know, New York Post story or New York Daily News story about what they're not doing. And we've seen a couple agencies that actually really um, done a better job. Um, you know, the big, big dollars, not surprisingly, are for, you know, major construction. And we end up giving it to these global firms uh, and that's where we're not getting close to MWB goals because on the, you know, we're, we've done a really good job on, you know, food purchases or clothing purchases, et cetera, small items, but not the big items. And what we're doing right now is working with bigger firms, you know, on subcontracting so that they can use local MWB firms, uh, even on bigger construction projects, subcontracting with MWBEs um, and also helping these MWBs grow. You know, there's been some, um, and I think we need to kind of invest and, and train um, some of these firms um, so that they can have the resources to grow, giving them, you know, low interest loans um, so that they can take on bigger projects they hadn't in the past and have the capacity to do so. Thank you. Um, Alistair, you have your hand raised. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Anisha. Uh, Adam, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. I think you have some very good points here. Um, really, really appreciate it. And it's nice to see the city thinking about the small businesses and trying to get them back back in. It's been really sad seeing the exodus of, uh, of businesses and people out of the city. Um, I do, I agree with you 100% on the DOB. Um, out of all the agencies I've experienced in the city, that's by far, in my experience, the worst and needs a total revamping. Um, I hope it can get done because it's problematic on many, on many fronts, on cost and time for a lot of, a lot of businesses. From a 10,000 foot level, uh, I'm not gonna go through each, each item here, but just some things to consider. Uh, what I've thought about is we need two general things in addition to what you've shown there. Uh, we need people to come back into the city. We've, we've had exodus of people leaving the city. Um, that was before COVID um, and COVID accelerated that. People have left and are continuing to leave the city. I, I think quality, quality of life issues is something that needs to be addressed here as well, because people don't want to be in a city with full quality of life. Um, so that should be a factor on here. Yeah. Um, I think uh, on the other end, the other part I have um, is the, 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 the regulatory environment. Although the intentions are obviously always good, nobody considers the negative effect of the regulatory uh, environment that we're in. Um, I'll give an example here. This is apartment management checklist. Okay. This is, if you want to run a property, this is your guide. It is about as thick as an iPhone. Okay. Pretty, pretty small print all over the place. This 10 years ago was about this thick. 
okay? It has grown exponentially in 10 years to the point that it is practically impossible to follow all the regulations in here. Yeah. And each regulation that's added is a cost to the business because you have to read it, you have got to comply somehow, that all takes time and money. So I think people have to consider the, the benefit cost analysis of regulation. Uh, again, they have a contention, but there's a cost. And this, this is putting small mom and pop businesses and landlords out of business because there's no way an individual or a little family can go through, can go through this. Whereas the big boys have a back office and they can navigate it, deal yeah. with it. So we're killing our small businesses. We're killing our, our small landlords with the regulatory environment that's been put in, even though it had good intentions. Yeah. Um, those, those are my main kind of high altitude points and we can, for the committee, go into the more details here, but yeah. I just want to mention that. Well, and I think that to speak on both of those things, I think we're very much aligned. You could you hold up the building code, but you could hold up the zoning code or the city charter or 18 other things where it's just layer on layer on layer, it's added and each is good intentions, but some contradict each other. Some are actually more of a hassle than, than actually a benefit. You know, some are just, there's some expose in the newspaper and we realize we need to put 19 new pieces of legislation, even though we actually already have that law and we're just not enforcing it. Yeah. Know, so it's time to actually review all of these very hefty and very thick manuals that we've created and say, this is outdated, this is redundant, this we can't enforce or don't enforce. This is actually more of a problem than it is a benefit. Like it's, it's time to do the opposite, not just the adding the new layers, but actually taking them back. Yeah. And I think that's something, you know, we, we actually start in the controller's office with our red tape report. Um, and, you know, we were happy that like SBS filed, took some of our suggestions, but not nearly enough. Mm -hmm. But like, this is our intention, which is like, yeah. you know, the next mayor, wherever that may be, like needs to think about the scaling back, not just the new adding. And this time now more than ever, when it comes to small businesses, when it comes to so many other things, we need to just to, to streamline, not, not to add new burdens. Um, so I think that's really important. And on the quality of life stuff, similarly, I think that was very much the, the um, the point of our kind of like invest in streets you know we saw on like the lower east side the, the kind of super block multiple closed streets that were connected to one another uh you know i think we've seen some you know in the summer we saw some energy for for some outdoor markets and you know next summer we're going to see outdoor music you know more easier permits for outdoor theater and music you know i think we need to think about investing in, in quality of life to attract people back um you know that's just so critical um ultimately you know, our businesses thrive because we're a dense city with lots of street traffic and people want to be out and about. But if, you know, if our sidewalks are filled with garbage and, you know, if, um, you know, if there's, if there's a re reduced quality of life, like that's not going to happen. Like we, we need to make sure that that's number one, that's first. Like making city, keeping New York City a magnet um, so that, you know, everyone thrives. Thank you. Please. So we'll do Andrew, then Susan, and then Andrea. Hi, uh, thanks for the thanks for the presentation. Um, I uh, I'm assuming because the uh, controller is also running for mayor, some of these things will be part of what what he hopes to achieve if he if he were elected. Um, and that raises two concerns for me. One is the uh, making it easier for people to obtain liquor licenses. Mm -hmm. um, certainly for our district. Uh, Having more establishments with liquor licenses is something that we've we've strived to uh, create a balance on, and particularly on this on this committee. So uh, that's that's a little concerning that a lot of this presentation seems to focus on restaurants and not on small daytime retail. And for every vacant storefront that we make it easier to get a liquor license for that competes with daytime retail. And that's been our ongoing problem in this neighborhood. Everybody wants a liquor license. Everybody wants a restaurant because they can pay more rent. And that makes it difficult for small daytime retail. And what we've actually seen um, pre-pandemic and now into the pandemic, if we've seen a lot of smaller stores opening. We've seen a lot of grab and go restaurants and we haven't seen this, this uh, you know, constant need for liquor licenses. So that, that's 
a little bit concerning and it ties into number 20, which is repurposing street pay space for restaurants, retail and community use. Retail and community use makes sense, but our open restaurant program in the, in the East Village has caused a significant amount of consternation for residences, particularly because there's absolutely no enforcement. Pretty much every open restaurant business in the East Village, I would say just anecdotally, 60 to 70% of them are not up to the code that is required. And many of them, frankly, are fully enclosed. Um, so before we say we're gonna make this permanent and that this is such a wonderful thing, um, we need to make sure there's regulations. We need to make sure, frankly, there's enforcement because now, you know, business, we need business. And of course we always need business, but we can't constantly be putting the need of business over the need of residents, which, which we've seen a lot of in the, in the district. Yeah, no, I very much understand that. I very much appreciate that. You know, I think to an extent, you know, given the exigencies of the, of the pandemic, uh, and businesses struggling, there needed to be a very quick, um, a quick, you know, a quick way to address it. And, and the open streets and open restaurants, I think, was smart in that front. You know, easy permitting. Um, you know, restrictions might have been limited. I mean, but I think you know, ultimately, restaurants need to open this quick in order to save themselves. I think moving forward, when we move outside of the pandemic, we can be more thoughtful about you know what uh, about inspections, about what's necessary in order for safety, uh, you know, what these um, restaurant spaces should look like. Um, and I definitely think there's room for that. And to an extent we're seeing it, you know, those early like really shabby, you know, caution tape uh, and a garbage bale, you know, that was garbage pail, that was the original ones are now being replaced by, you know, nicer wooden structures with flowers, um, are safer, are wider. But nicer wooden structures that in many cases are attached to the building without permits, running electricity with extension cords and fully enclosed. Yeah, so there, for sure. There's room for better enforcement, but I also don't want to overcorrect and get back to that problem we said before, where it's, it's this thick, you know, the open restaurants and then suddenly only 15 restaurants in East Village and zero restaurants in Jackson Heights can do it. You know, so I think we need to maintain that balance that you're right. There was a rush, there was urgency because businesses were struggling, but at the, on the other end of it, we don't wanna create uh, you know, a 400 page booklet of how to get an open restaurant and go back to the days where you know, we didn't have, I think a fairly vibrant um, outdoor spaces when it came to restaurants. Um, so you know, I think we need to take a citywide outlook and think about um, not being too prescriptive, but also being smart. Um, Seizing your next, but I, I'll, can I just add one thing to Andrew's question? Um, it, it's not something that needs to be answered now, but I'll reframe Andrew's question a little bit. Out of all of the, the, the issue that we struggle with as a community is diversity of businesses because we have a saturation. So maybe as a, like my follow-up question that can be answered later is out of this list of stuff, what are the things that we could use to encourage more daytime businesses to open when things are going to be shifting? Mm -hmm. Since that is something that the community desires. Yeah, I will say one thing, which I think is really important, which is something we've talked about with SBS and I wish they went farther on it, is this recommendation number 13, the re-entrepreneurship program, which has been really successful in, in Montreal and in, um, uh, where else, in Barcelona which is a lot of small businesses, retail businesses, flower stores, et cetera, the daytime businesses, when they close, and it's because you know, they're retiring and they don't have uh, children or a sibling to pass the business on to, um, and the business goes down with them and that business is lost. You know, what they've created in Montreal and Barcelona is this re-entrepreneurship program where you actually have businesses post their business online through an exchange and say, you know, this is my business, this is how much money I'm making, these are my um, you know, uh, importers um, and people who want to become business owners can go on that exchange and take over an existing business. So I think we can do a much better job with that business succession um, and helping connecting aspiring business owners to existing business owners so that these like really important, um, you know, neighborhood stores aren't lost and just become another bar. Uh, and that's, I think that's just another thing that's worked elsewhere and we have not taken advantage of. We have a lot of, uh, you know, business owners who are ready for retirement. Um, and especially with this pandemic, they might be saying, I could continue, but it's such a hassle, forget about it. And then that business is lost. Like, let's think about reconnecting them with, you know, aspiring business owners so we can maintain those, those institutions. Interesting. That's a cool idea. 
Susan. Uh, thank you. I would like to ask about these tax credits. Um, are these city, are these state? What is the process? You know, it's, it, you know, of course we would like tax credits, but what are, where do they, where does the money come from and how do you get them? Or how do we get that kind of program? So for the first one, there's two, we, we had two different ones we create, we were proposing. One is a business tax credit, which is you know, a, a pretty small tax. Uh, we're saying for businesses, I believe, I don't have an, I can look through it, but for, for smaller businesses, they could use that business tax credit to, for outdoor seating, for PPE equipment, for other like reopening costs and maintaining their businesses, um, you know, for corrals, for um, delivery, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that was kind of a smaller tax to help people out. And then I think more impactful was that high vacancy retail corridor. Um, and for that one, we would actually have to, um, and we've already started this to an extent, is to, to map the different retail corridors and look at what share of businesses are vacant. And over a certain number, say 10, 15%, when we see it pass that threshold, you offer um, property tax credits towards new businesses. Um, and I think the reason why that's so critical, and you, you guys know this, like it's, these things build on themselves. You know, a couple of vacancies are whatever, people are ready for something new. But once half the block is vacant, suddenly people don't walk down that block anymore. You know, right. these things compound on each other. It's like, we need to be very, very careful about those threshold issues to make sure we don't get over that number where people start saying, that block's empty, that block's dangerous, that block is whatever, and then every other business suffers. So we want to just be very, very mindful and think on a block level, think on a corridor level, uh, and think about how, like, a certain uptick in vacancies can really snowball. Um, so that, that's the idea there is just, just being kind of kind of more data focused and thinking about those dynamics. If I could just add on to what Anisha and Andrew said, um, this is not about restaurants uh, in general, but the problem we've had here are many restaurants that don't open before five. Mm. So we have exactly what you're talking about, blocks of blocks of, of um, blank storefronts. Yeah. And of course, nobody can open a retail because there's no, as you say, there's no um, uh, foot traffic there. Mm. So, you know, maybe in thinking about, um, you know, trying to, uh, you know, offer uh, uh, an incentive, it might be for, um, for businesses that are open during the day. Yeah, because actually, I, really, has, I never yeah, thought about that. I think that's really smart. I like that a lot. So yeah. I'm one. Okay. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, Thank you. you know, all hours of the day, we need people. Andrea, you're next. Hi, thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation. I just have a quick question about point 17. I don't know anything about Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the specifics about the accelerator program that's being proposed. Yeah, it's a really exciting program. Um, you know, I've I've talked to a few folks there, and I think you know if you know if the city was implemented or if the next mayor was implemented, we'd have to know a lot more about it and bring them over, maybe even to run it. But um, yeah, it's about um, you know selecting you know maybe a class of, of fifty to hundred um, MWBs you know every year. Um, providing you know mentorship, providing strategic loans, providing um, subsidies for for rent, um, you know to open up their business. Um, so I think it, it's really about you know thinking about businesses at the ground level um, and helping them uh, expand and giving them the supports they need uh, to do that. Um, and yeah, I think Cincinnati's been been really successful uh, on that front. Uh, and I think yeah, especially especially now we need to um, just be be really smart about uh, encouraging entrepreneurship. Uh, in this city, and that's that's a successful way to do it. Are there any other? Alicia, I got a question. Sure, go ahead. I can't raise my hand. Sorry. Um, so, out of um, I, and you could probably get back to me if you want, but like, out of these proposals, which ones have legislation already in the works? Um, which ones have there anybody have any been? sort of passed and need to be expanded upon, um, but where where are they at sort of um, politically right now? Yeah, um, well, I'm seeing a couple here. So number 11, this kind of comprehensive inventory of vacant storefronts. Um, there was kind of initial legislation, which I think needs to be built upon. So the idea there is the city should, you know, 
when a business owner or a building owner has a vacant lot, they're required to report that the um, storefront is vacant so that the city can collect that information on a neighborhood level. And the idea would be that the city should have a map of every single vacancy um, around each neighborhood so that people can see you know, what's A, where there are vacancies, but also would have information on what's the square footage of the building, what building systems are already in place, et cetera. So it's like a, a very easy map um, to look at, you know, what, where space is available uh, in the neighborhoods that you think your business could thrive. Um, a year ago, they put together uh, legislation that just required the um, landlords to report that they have vacant um, storefronts. We want a little more information there. So it's actually like, not just to track where there's vacancies and say like, it sucks that this neighborhood isn't doing well. We know there's a lot of vacancies there, but actually be actionable to, um, so it's information for potential business owners. Um, they, uh, they were supposed to, I think, actually launch that map maybe even like last month and they haven't done it yet. Now, obviously a lot of things are going on right now and some things have fallen by the wayside, but we're gonna, I think we're gonna wait another couple of weeks and press them to like actually uphold the, the law so that they're kind of launch, providing that information on vacancies. So that, that's one thing to push. We think that's like important information. We should know block by block, neighbor by neighborhood where there are vacancies and hopefully get that information. Um, I mentioned the PPP loans. No, SBS every day is doing a um, events on like how, how to help people to sign up for the PPP loans. They're trying to do, they have like a hotline available. Like we really think they should be getting bids, getting new boards, like proactively reach out, go door to door to get people to like remind them that the PPP program has been relaunched, get that, you know, get the money. Like there's, it's a lot of dollars that are just being left on the table. So, you know, only about 30 to 40% of New York city businesses have signed up for it. That's, that's really unfortunate. Um, what else is kind of already in the works? I'm thinking um, about things that maybe community board could support, you know, or, or how we can have sort of an- Yeah, there is, program. for the SNAP benefits one, there is state legislation, um, you know, that for SNAP benefits, you should be able to use it at local restaurants, not just grocery stores, especially for those who might have um, disabilities, might have issues, you know, cooking at home or have a small apartment and don't have, um, you know, the proper equipment to uh, cook at home. Like there are, Within the federal government, there are um, allowances that you can extend SNAP benefits for, for restaurants, uh, but the state has not opted in. It would be the legislation at the state level would be to opt into that, to allow to certain uh, group people or everyone who maybe receives SNAP benefits to use it at restaurants. We think that would be uh, helpful for those who are homebound and also helpful for local restaurants. Um, what else is... Um, the moratorium on commercial evictions is in place right now. We just like expires every couple months. We need to always like press the governor to, um, to, to re-up it. Mm. What needs to happen to um, pass that one that's, you know, um, that gives you a cure period for violations instead of automatically fining? I think that's- like Yeah, so you could, I mean, that could definitely- already does that. I, I don't understand why every other city agency doesn't. Yeah, I think, um, I, I mean, city council legislation get that done. You know, that's like regulatory code. Um, so I think you're pressing your city council members to make that more. Um, what, what else is, is there? Oh, like the occupational license requirements is something else, you know, again, to help entrepreneurs. Um, you know, there's like, for for being a hairdresser or masseuse, etc., sometimes there's more requirements than becoming, you know, a police officer. Um, it's like it's it's really um, warped in, in terms of what you know what we anticipate like the occupational requirements are sometimes. Um, so we're talking about like pulling back uh, some of those. That's at the state level, you know, to encourage just you know more more entrepreneurs, more masseuses, more hairdressers, etc. Um, those daytime businesses. Actually, I think really the occupational requirements are really holding back. The daytime businesses more than the nighttime businesses. That's something to, to think about. Um, just all the like mounds and mounds and mounds of hours you need to put in and paperwork you need to sign up in order to get um, an occupational license. That's at the state level. We have a couple of hands up. Um, Herman, good question. Uh, yes, it's more it's it's more like um, an observation in terms of uh, looking at this list. The, the thing about lists of this kind is that when you're thinking about um, protecting it or making it easier for somebody else, some other people is affected. Of 
for instance, when you're talking about uh, 11 space, that spaces should be free of charge. Who maintains that that space, and what does the person who owns that space would lose just giving up their spaces? Because when you give free spaces, uh, for a, a, a property owner would give a free space. It means the property owner is losing and they are not getting any adjustments on their taxes and they're not getting any adjustment on the services they provide. Oh, for that one, it's not the space is free of charge. It's just that the access to the inventory is free of charge. Like right now you have to go through like commercial real estate brokers in order to get information on, you know, what's vacant and what's not. The idea is the city would post online all the vacancies so that aspiring business owners could see all the spaces that are vacant and like the building specs. So yeah, we're not making the spaces free. I, un I understand that. But then <laughs> that's why I said that when you make adjustment for something else, something else is there. Totally okay. Yeah. I'm a real estate broker and that is my trade and that is how I make my living. I also manage uh, commercial properties, which means I know that when somebody's not paying the rent, the rest of the tenants in the building has to be paying the rent. Who, how does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If the adjustment, for instance, the people who now are not paying rent because of the COVID stuff and is paying rent and using the sidewalk. Somebody has to understand that sooner or later, it's either that property owner or that space owner is going to be in trouble, mm -hmm. the, at which they are at this point. There are buildings that I manage for low, for not-for-profit business that has storefront that is vacant or have um, tenants that cannot pay their, their rent. So what the city does is they create a moratorium every six months or every three months and every stuff. So it's like kicking the can down the street. What happens eventually when the moratorium is over and those people have to account for the rent? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. And I, I just wanna say that um, we do have a stop in a few minutes. So we could probably fit one, one more question and then anything after that, happy to answer over email or uh, I can come back and uh, help the committee out in any way I can. Alistair, do you wanna ask your question, Herman? I think your question is something we need to talk about also as a yes. as the committee. Okay. Sure, Adam, I'm just gonna do um, two, two things. Uh, it actually goes on what Herman just mentioned. Mm -hmm. The I was all for registering the vacant storefronts. I, I, we, 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 we manage properties, we have stores, we have vacant storefronts. Fine, I was like, oh, that's a great idea. I'll, we'll, we'll, I, it sounds like a good idea. When it rolled out, it was extremely complicated process to fill it in. It took our office a, a tremendous amount of time to navigate to fill it in. Um, I don't understand what the end result purpose is. I think you mentioned that the end result is that people can see all the storefronts. I think if a business wants to open up, they drive in the neighborhood that they're interested in. They see what stores are vacant. There's a sign that says store for rent mm -hmm. and they call that broker. I think the, the private sector with the brokers manages that very well. The brokers are very hungry to um, rent the store because the, the landlord pays the, um, the broker fee and it works from that. I, again, I don't know if the benefit cost of, the re of registering the storefronts is, is, is good because on our end as landlords, it was actually a very complicated task to complete. And now you're talking about making it more complicated and adding more information. That's gonna take more time, which is more money and more time uh, taken away from how you know uh, landlords can handle tenants, et cetera. So, so why was it complicated? If you could follow up with Luke. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, just the data, the data entry was, we didn't have some of the data. We had to go figure out the data. A lot of people don't even know the square footage necessarily. You know, that's held by the broker. When was it last leased? You know, does it come with, heat this and that it just you know a lot of times you, you you just don't know that you leave that to the broker he rents it and that's that mm. with the eviction moratorium you're talking two things you want to you want landlords to rent vacant spaces 
but at the same time, you're saying there's an eviction moratorium. Landlords are not gonna be interested in renting spaces if there's an eviction moratorium because they wanna know, listen, the last thing we wanna do is evict a tenant because there's no demand out there for the spaces. So right now, nobody wants to evict. I mean, if they can make a deal with a tenant, I'd prefer to get one, you know, 10 cents on the dollar than, than nothing. But if the tenant is a bad player and he is not, not you know, just taking advantage of the situation, you do need that, that leverage to be able to say, listen, I'm gonna do, you know, follow through with um, eviction proceedings because of X, Y, and Z. So that's an incentive against landlords renting out uh, storefronts or taking risks with potential tenants that they, hey, that tenant, I'm not sure about his credit, I'm not sure about this. You know what? There's an eviction moratorium. I'm not going to rent to him because I don't want to be stuck with him. So you, we've got, you've got to, you guys have to analyze the benefit and costs on all these things. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's, that's all I have to say for now. Yeah, right here. Well, thank you so much, you guys, for, for coming and presenting. Um, Luke, I think we'll have some follow up. So I'll, I'll email you after. Definitely. Uh, thank you all in my emails in the chat. So you can either send questions to Anisha or Susan or um, to me directly with this or anything else I could be of help with. But uh, thank you for having us and uh, hopefully this gave you some ideas that um, you'll be able to move forward with. Yeah. Thank you. Really thank you. So with that, um, I would like to open it up to discussion. Sorry, I don't know if there's like a little bit of echo for me. Weird. Um, discussion from the committee as to any ideas that people had about specific items, maybe from this list or other things that you've thought about that we'd like to explore further and do potential resolutions, um, either in support of or things that I guess maybe we're concerned about. Um, Alistair, you sort of requested this last month. Um, so if you have anything you'd like to propose, we can sort of discuss it. I think, Megan, if you could take notes and then maybe we could come up with a few things and then we'll sort of set a plan for researching and figuring out how to put together resolutions for this. Um, one of the things that I do want to be sensitive about is that there has been a lot of feedback that um, all, a lot of the relief programs, recovery programs are for small businesses and for good reason they are, but there are a lot of different players in this ecosystem of economic development and in the ecosystem of our neighborhoods. And so we need to listen to the concerns and think about the concerns for a wide variety of people. Um, so while we may not always agree with the stances of every, um, you know, stakeholder here, um, I do want to say that we should give everybody the time to talk about what their concerns are. So feel free to uh, raise your hand if you have anything to say, but maybe Alistair, if you want to kick us off. Oh God. <laughs> Thanks, or not, or Andrew also <laughs> okay. has his okay. first, of all, first of all, I want to thank you for putting this together. This is uh, fantastic. And I think it's a good starting, starting point. Um, there's a lot of items on that list and I don't know the best way for us to go through that. I mean, if we went through every single item, I think we'll be here till the next day um, if we were to discuss it. Um, I mean, I, I think a lot of the items are very positive. Um, and I guess we, we I, I'm just not sure the, the right process, whether we go through each item slowly and debate it and then figure out if we want to add that to a resolution, if that's good or if we think that's good for businesses or the best way to do it. But I, I do I do think a lot of those points were were good in, in, in some ways. And obviously some of them had their issues with regards to the liquor licenses, et cetera, which, which I totally understand. Um, and those have to be discussed as well and, and pointed out. Um, so, so we can we can do it a couple of ways. I think if we wanted to pull up that list again um, and share it on the screen and go through and maybe pick a few that we want to sort of start with, um, that's one way to do it. But if there was or if there was anything in particular that people really gravitated to, or frankly anything not on that list, because there are a lot of issues in the community that we could also sort of address. Um, so maybe Andrew will go to you and then um, see see where to go from there. Sure, sure. I, I would say two things for the sake of brevity and the, the reality that this is someone who's running for elected office. Mm -hmm. I don't think going through their 
platform one by one is, is appropriate unless we're going to get everybody else in here and hear their it, platform. It, it, could, I, could I just interrupt for a second? We cannot talk about somebody running for office. We really cannot manage, uh, mention it at all. We just had a lecture from the borough president's office about it. So if we could just not deal with that in, in the meeting. All right. I, I think my point point is is understood. Um, right. So a couple of things that I thought were no brainers um, were this notion of some sort of uh, uh, database or Craigslist type of thing where if you're surrendering your business because you're tired or you're retiring, et cetera, you can post that. And somebody, I mean, we have an example on Avenue A, Baker's Pizza. The guy in the building loved the pizza. The old, older guy was retiring. He sold the pizzeria to the young guy who lived in the building. The pizzeria remained. Um, so that, you know, that's kind of a perfect, perfect story. So I thought that was good. I liked Susan's amendment to tax incentives. I think the idea of giving tax incentives to businesses that will be open during the day is, is a great idea. I mean, you look at one of our most thriving retail corridors, 9th Street, um, you know, that, that does have coffee shops, it does have restaurants, Vasilka anchors it on the corner, you got mud, but big chunk of it are clothing stores and gift shops that, that really feed off of each other. So I think a resolution, not necessarily tonight, but whenever we're ready to, to support uh, that. And, you know, a restaurant that's open during the day is great as well. Um, you know, so I, those were two real low hanging fruit for me that I thought we could get behind. I agreed with both of those because I also think they sort of pointed to the, um, diversity of retail question that we're always trying to search for. Um, so I think like proposing those two things uh, make a lot of sense. And really the point of tonight is just to gather, like to gather the ideas and then I'll try to figure out like people who can come and talk to us about fleshing this stuff out so we can write resolutions and we won't write them tonight because I don't think any of us know enough about any of these things yet to, to do it. Um, Megan, I think you had your hand up. Yeah, there was one thing, and maybe Susan um, can remember it, but uh, he brought it up again. In Bloomberg's days, they had like a one-stop shop for permitting process. And in back then, it was to open a restaurant. Um, but it can be to open any business, right? Because you need, um, you need approval by DOB, sometimes FDNY, multiple different agencies to to open a business. Um, and there it was all in one place. I, you know, I, the red tape around the different agencies and one not talking to the other is like infuriating when you're trying to open a business. So I think in order to encourage new businesses, um, we should make it easier for them to open. I think that's a, I think that's a great idea. Um, <clears throat> The other thing, just as you know, restaurant owners concerned, the the cap the third party um, delivery apps, the amount of money that they take from restaurant owners is is ridiculous, and they've kind of, um, you know, they do this uh, like disrupt the system kind of thing, and now you have to go through them. Um, it's ridiculous. They they don't give you access to your own data. Um, they they take more than your profit margin. Um, so whatever we can do to sort of keep those caps, I know they cap them in city council, um, to keep those caps, um, and to make them, force them to share data, um, I'd encourage. Um, and also the, the last thing about the, um, <clears throat> about allowing cure periods before fines I'm interested in. Cool. Um, so all of those make sense to me also. Um, Alistair. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, uh, I, I agree with all those comments. And I do think, I, th I think with the, because I've been talking to my restaurant tenants and the, I agree with Megan, the, the apps take a lot of money. And I don't, I don't think that money comes back into the city. Those are, those are big corporations. I'm not sure where they're based, but that's extra. And we all got food delivery before the apps existed. So they've just kind of come in and taken money out of our 
little economy and moved it elsewhere. So I, I totally agree that, that something needs to be done there. And then I'll just go back to my 10,000 foot view of, you know, I do think quality of life needs to be mentioned um, and, you know, trying to attract people back into the city. And I do think that the regulatory environment needs to be looked into and kind of analyze what's, what's the benefit versus the cost of a lot of these regulations that exist. Uh, it's really become very burdensome. It's uh, burdensome, I know, for the restaurants. It's extremely burdensome for our businesses. Um, you know, I can go through lots of examples, which I don't want to bore you with, but um, I think those two factors uh, would, would be important for me too. And the DOB getting revamped, which is a disaster. Um, thank you. So those are broader and I will have to think more about like what specifically in those issues we would want to tackle, but I will add them to the list of, of things to keep on discussing. Richard? Not adding a new idea, just saying thank you to Alistair for his visual. Uh, anytime somebody can get a city regulatory guidebook that is that thick and present it to the people who are presenting to us, it makes people stand up and notice. So congratulations, Alistair, for throwing that out there. Yeah, Good for you. It's, it's, it's a torture to just go through that book. I, I gotta tell you, you know, it just, I, I can talk about many examples, but it's just, it's, a, it's, it's, it's awful, it really yeah. is. I have one more, Anisha. I think we should, um, I think at least for the next year, we can pretty much guarantee that um, open restaurants are probably gonna be here. So maybe we should think about doing something because I know um, the residents want more enforcement and the, the bar and restaurant owners would like more uniform enforcement, like where one, or one inspector no, says the same thing as the next inspector and they don't contradict each other. So um, maybe we could be asking if we're gonna continue with the open restaurant program, how to get the enforcement in line. So Susan, I see your hand up. Oh, I don't I know if that's you, in this committee, but. I think you should come to transportation next week because okay. that resolution is happening. Okay, <laughs> that's what I thought. Um, so I think all of these are, are really, Good ideas. Are, is there anything else that sort of jumped out at anybody? Um, I don't. I know there are hesitations about the list, but I don't know if it's helpful to look at that again. Um, um, but I think we can. There are at least five pretty concrete ones here, and then the quality of life and regulatory environment (DOB). I think we need to figure out and do some more thinking about which issue. But um, the succession entrepreneurs. I don't remember what the actual term was that they yeah. said um the tax incentives for daytime businesses the one-stop shop for businesses more broadly than just restaurants um third-party delivery app fees cure periods and then the quality of life in DOB. Andrew, you had and your... i ah. think just to add uh, alistair's basic and i think that just the reducing the re red taping regulations right i'm not sure how we we tackle it but at some point <laughs> the eviction moratorium needs to be dealt with um, because all we're seeing is businesses piling up back rent and that frankly trickles up if right. if commercial tenants aren't paying rent landlords are cutting back on services um, I, I certainly can see it in in the buildings that Westminster runs porters are getting laid off supers are getting laid off because they can't charge as much rent for the apartments or the apartments are vacant and then the mm -hmm. businesses are not. I, I'm not saying we should lift, lift the moratorium, but something's got to give. Either the businesses need to be given relief or the landlords need to be given relief because at the end of the day, all this money's going to be owed and nobody's really, really benefiting. So... I agree. And I don't have an answer to what it's supposed to be, but I think it would be interesting to see who we could get to talk about what people are thinking about in terms of that. Um, because I think this goes to what Herman was mentioning before that like we, and a lot of the, you know, recommendations on that list 
provide incentives or relief to one part of the chain, but it's not entirely clear how it affects everything else. And I think particularly the eviction moratorium, I certainly am not an expert, but would be very interested to see how all of the different sides are thinking about it. Andrea, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, I was just thinking about the um, uh, MWB piece and I was remembering um, we had passed a resolution, I think it was last month or maybe the one before regarding the zip code um, use. Mm -hmm. um, I would just wanna kind of follow up on that or track it and figure out where we would need to go um, in order to ensure equity and um, CB3 small businesses and in yeah. like Lower East Side Chinatown. What, what is that one, Andrea? Um, that it, was the resolution we did last month, um, which oh, was okay. the zip codes instead of like other indicators for uh, like LMI businesses or yeah. businesses located in LMI areas. Um, so certainly following up on that, but also maybe like I think some of those recommendations that we've heard about were really good um, in terms of just how the city should be like distributing a lot of things, frankly. Um, so continuing to see what, how SBS is, is giving out the relief funds. Susan. Um, I believe SBS has recognized now that that was a big mistake. Um, and if just a suggestion, if you want, we could have SBS, you know, come discuss what they're going to do instead or any other you know issues you might want them to discuss yeah i think um we should follow up and see if we can get an update on that um so it's 7 30. if there are any other questions or comments anybody has about this particular we can keep on talking but if there's if there's anything else um or we can sort of close this period because we think we do have a number of um, things and, and things to work on. And um, Megan and I will sort of figure out how to put together a resolution for whatever we can for next month or bring in speakers for some of these issues to sort of move the process along. Motion, motion to adjourn. <laughs> we have two more things. Oh. But <laughs> okay. They're very, very quick though. Um, one is I did want to give an update on the special district stuff. Um, we are still scheduling with Avima. I think we'll try to get to April um, instead of March, just because things are still oh, very up in the air. Um, and then we will still plug along, but things have not really changed for us with the pandemic. Um, so it still continues to be hard to do outreach, but we will keep on trying as, as much as we can. Um, but certainly Avima is, is on the docket. Um, are there any questions about that? Okay, and then the last thing is that um, there were a couple of bids that met uh, over like over the last month. Um, I know the Elias partnership met. I think the Chinatown bid. If there are any, if, if there is anybody who has any uh, who went to any of those meetings and would like to share any information on that, please do. Otherwise, we can always do it at another meeting as well. Do you mean the annual meetings? Mm hmm Oh. Um, was there anything particularly informative that came out of initiatives that the partnership is working on or? Let me think, let me just refresh my memory and you can come back to me. We can always do it next month too. Okay. I think it's, we're leaving space to like be updated for um, the cabs and the, the bids, but if there aren't any, then I think that was all of the agenda. Susan, anything else from you? No, I, um, uh, no, but you know, the election came up. Um, I just want to let people know the borough president had her lawyer speak to the district managers uh, because the election, how to deal with it always becomes a big issue. And they cautioned us against speaking about it or referring to it in any, in any way. It usually comes up more at full board when people want to speak. But um, just, I just wanted to let people know that that happened. Well, Susan, yeah. uh, it strikes me that there's a fine line. We are the Economic Development Committee and representatives of an elected official has have made a presentation to us 
presumably for the benefit of our of us and our businesses. But you'd have to be living in a hole to not know that their boss is running for citywide office. How do you, how are we supposed to distinguish it? I mean, it's, it's they okay. are presenting. They are clearly what they did presented today was clearly um, an initiative from their office. They cannot they cannot say you know when John Brown becomes mayor he will he or she will do this and we can't refer to it. They you know absolutely can talk about their initiatives. Okay. And, and we did when we asked them to come, we, we said specifically that it has to be something that like the office is, has yeah. been working on, um, not anything related to whatever else might be happening with, um, with this. But I, I, I see the point and um, we'll figure out how to like make that more transparent next time. <laughs> um, with that, Rodney, I mean, Richard, up to you. We can- go. Motion to adjourn. No, <laughs> we just do the uh, closing vote. Okay. How, how would you like it worded? <laughs> Megan, you're up. Megan, you have to do the roll call. Yeah, the roll call. <laughs> oh, sorry, I was on mute. Sorry, I just need to find my minutes for him. Give me, give me one sec. Um, there we go. Okay, um, Anisha Steven. Yes. Um, Megan Joy, yes. Alistair Economakis. Yes. Andre Gordillo. Yes. Herman Hewitt. Herman, you there? Yes. Yep. David Louie. Yes. Alexandra Melitano. Yes. Richard Ropiak. Yes. Rodney Washington. Yes. Andrew. Yes. Thank you guys. Have a good night. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Thanks.